keep us on track as best I can. So I will just uh, take a moment to welcome you all to um, our best of showcase this afternoon. Um, this is our final showcase of the series. Um, and so for folks, I know, like I said, there's lots of familiar names. I've seen you at some other sessions this week and last week. Um, but if you weren't able to attend or if you attended but haven't checked it out yet, um, recordings are available for um, most of these sessions on our YouTube channel. Um, and then this last one today will be posted uh, in the next couple of business days. So um, a good resource there if you want to go back and revisit or if you weren't able to attend live, those recordings will be available on our YouTube channel. And then I also just want to take a, a moment to talk about some other upcoming events that Akuhawai is hosting. Um, so we are just about 10 days away from our um, academic initiatives, business operations, and housing facilities conferences, which are all running concurrently. Um, I may see some of you there. We will be in Columbus, Ohio, um, which is where our central office is located. So you'll get to see lots of our staff at the conference this year. But registration remains open uh, for those conferences. And then to round out our year, we have several virtual opportunities coming up. Um, Stars College, which is for those undergrads that may be interested in student affairs and housing careers. Um, registration remains open for just a couple more days for that. Um, and then our Multicultural Institute and our Live-In Symposium will be held in October and November. Um, and both of those opportunities offer team passes. So if you're looking to bring um, multiple people from your campus, um, there's some really good rates there for bringing uh, multiple people to those virtual events. And then, um, you know, as I said, we're we're closing in at the end of 2023. And so we are looking ahead to 2024. And if you are interested in serving in a leadership role with the association, we're looking for some chair level leadership positions. Um, we also have some faculty opportunities um, and that QR code there. And then I will put in the chat as well, the website to look at for more information about all those opportunities. Um, but lots of great ways to get involved. Um, and even if you're not ready for a leadership position, if you're just looking for, um, you know, how to join a committee, how to join a network, the information for that is on that page as well. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Corey Peacock, Dean of Students at Casper College and 2023 AIMHO Best of Program winner. Thank you so much, Meredith, for the intro. Let me just take a moment to share my screen. Great. All right, well, like Meredith said, my name is Corey Peacock, and I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of Students at Casper College, which is a community college in Casper, Wyoming. And my presentation is called Supervising Like a Boss and Representing the AIMHO Region. Uh, I see at least a couple of AIMHO uh, names in the audience, so I'd love to see the, the AIMHO support here. I wanted to start before we dive into some of this supervision content, just with a couple of notes about today's session. When I presented this back at AIMHO in uh, November, uh, and this is, if, if anyone knows me, this is kind of my presentation style. I like my presentations to be really interactive, definitely a believer in uh, the shared wisdom that we cultivate with others. Uh, that doesn't always translate the best in a webinar space. So instead of breakout activities, uh, I'll give you some recommended exercises that you could do with your colleagues, with mentors, with your staff. And if you would like me to send you the slide deck so you can see these, if, if you don't have time to scribble them down, uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, I would be happy to send you all of my materials, um, including the supervision manual that uh, I've created for my current and uh, most recently former institution. Another note, uh, since last November, when I presented this at AIMHO, I uh, completed my doctoral dissertation, which I also did on the topic of supervision within housing residence life. And so I've sprinkled in just a little bit uh, from the participants from my dissertation study. Uh, I think it, it's just neat to hear from folks who aren't me. So a big shout out to my participants. Uh, you'll see their pseudonyms uh, throughout have just a couple of quotes. Uh, my dissertation study asked uh, my participants also to make an art project, a visual representation of their experience, either being supervised as an entry-level pro within housing residence life or 
providing supervision to entry level folks for uh, more senior uh, level leaders. And so we'll have the opportunity to see, I think there are two pieces of artwork that I'll share with you today. So I uh, wanted to start with those disclaimers. In terms of what we're going to talk about today, um, I thought I'd present that by the numbers. So I'm going to start by telling you two stories, one that's in higher ed and one that's outside of higher ed. And those will each lead to what I consider to be a problem that we have within our field and actually across industries regarding supervision. I'll go over three different supervision models, one that I created uh, and then two that come from the literature. And then we'll end with one call to action. Uh, so if, if you'll permit me, I'll end by kind of getting on my soapbox for a little bit. In terms of learning outcomes, I, I took these from the Akuhuai core curriculum. So today I'm hoping to touch quite a bit on the human resources competency area, a little on foundations, and then of course a little on leadership as well. But without further ado, let's dive into uh, the first story. And I thought it would be neat to start outside of higher education. Uh, and the reason I tell you a story that has nothing to do with higher ed is to demonstrate that issues of supervision, I really believe, touch all industries. And so I'd like to tell you about my good friend, Johnny. Johnny is a structural engineer. And when he started his career after getting his master's in structural engineering, he started at an engineering firm in Casper, Wyoming, my current town. And he stayed at the same firm for about seven years. And in those seven years, he had the same supervisor throughout. And this supervisor, his career trajectory was what I would guess is pretty typical for most industries. He was a really gifted engineer and then eventually was promoted into a role where suddenly he was supervising others. And as, as folks find, the skills that are required to be a good supervisor, and in this supervisor's case, the skills that are required to be a really awesome structural engineer can be very different, right? Uh, and we often don't do a great job across industries of teaching people how do you manage others in a way that uh, is going to be growth-minded, uh, developmentally focused, and, and kind. And so Johnny found this supervisor to be very toxic, uh, unapproachable, and very difficult to work with. Uh, as a new engineer, he really craved feedback. He would ask his supervisor, you know, what am I doing well? What can I improve on? And his supervisor would always say, you're doing great, no concerns. But then at the end of the year, uh, the firm would do performance-based bonuses, and Johnny would always be lumped into the lowest performance category. And when that happened the first time, he went up to a supervisor and asked, I noticed that you put me in the lowest category. Uh, what could I do better? And his supervisor kind of blew up at him and would berate him for questioning his authority. And that really shut down Johnny that, you know, this is not really a person that I can go to to have candid conversations, uh, even on things that are really impactful, like the amount of the bonus you get at the end of the year. So over time, Johnny became more and more unhappy at this firm, and it was starting to spill over into the rest of his life. Uh, he started to be really depressed. His mental health kind of took a turn, and he just wasn't his happy self when he went home to his family at the end of the day. So at, uh, after seven years of putting up with this difficult manager, he decided, uh, he and his family decided they were going to move all the way across the country to Wenatchee, Washington. So joined a new firm, uh, as some of us, I think, can relate in higher ed. Uh, especially if you live in a state that doesn't have a lot of institutions. There are only so many places in Wyoming um, that hire structural engineers with Johnny's specific specialty. Um, and so that was the closest he could find to his family, was moving all the way out to Wenatchee. And at first, things were great. Uh, the whole not getting feedback thing was definitely not the MO of the new supervisor. But then over time, he found that that was because the pendulum had swung in the complete opposite direction. He really felt like this new supervisor was a micromanager, uh, wanted to know where he was, what he was doing every minute of every day, would double check um, even the most routine work and would really hover around Johnny's desk, making it feel like he couldn't even really breathe without uh, worrying about uh, being berated by his supervisor. So you can probably guess where, where this story is going. He moved again, picked up the whole family, and, and now they're in Knoxville, Tennessee. 
Uh, and thankfully, the story has a happy ending. He is really loving his firm. It's been two years. Uh, but I share this story with you to illustrate just how much of an impact a poor supervisor or poor workplace culture can have not only on the employee's workplace happiness, but on their entire life and their family's life as well. I happen to be the godfather of his two daughters, uh, and I think about their experience. Of course, it's not their fault uh, that, you know, dad had a, a supervisor that, that wasn't great, but they've now uh, moved states, moved climates, moved homes, switched schools, switched friend groups twice now in their young lives, partially because of poor supervision. So this leads us to what I would consider problem number one, which is poor supervision can have immense negative consequences on individuals extending beyond the workplace, possibly creating ripple effects within the person's life, family, and overall sense of well-being. And uh, if you don't want to take it just from me, let's hear from some of my dissertation participants. So Lance, which is a pseudonym, of course, uh, who's a mid-level housing pro, gave this beautiful quote that I just love. Your supervisor has so much impact on your quality of day-to-day -day life. If you have a good supervisor, they can make things easier. But if you have a bad supervisor, it can accumulate this sense of dread, and eventually you're going to reach your tipping point. I'd also like to share with you uh, Gary, who's an entry-level housing pro. Um, it was quite uh, moving when Gary shared with me his visual art project. I asked Gary and all of my other uh, participants to do a visual representation of their experience, either supervising or uh, providing supervision. And Gary is an entry-level pro. Uh, this was what he came up with for his experience being supervised as an entry-level staff. This piece was titled, The Struggle of Supervision, Am I Good Enough? And he definitely had a couple of supervisors in his early career that made him feel that he was not uh, good enough. A really powerful image. Uh, so I share that with you to say that this is a topic that really matters and affects people's lives. On to the second story, which is a housing and residence life story. About eight-ish years ago, uh, I was hired to join a flagship state institution as the assistant director of selection and training. And on my very first day, uh, my supervisor uh, sat down with me and told me, uh, this was in March, told me a very troubling statistic. It said that this department that I had just joined lost 44% of the RAs between fall and spring semester of that year. Now, a couple of them you know, left for the typical reasons you would think of. Some went to study abroad, a couple went to go student teach, a couple graduated at semester, but the vast majority of these 44% were still living on campus, they were still students, they just chose to self-select out of the RA position in the middle of the year because they didn't want to be an RA anymore. So I took it upon myself to try to find out why, and I thought I was really in a good position to do that. I was the new guy, so if they wanted to talk about things in the department that they maybe didn't appreciate. You know, uh, who better to talk to than someone who wasn't there? Uh, so I reached out to all of the folks who left uh, voluntarily, not because they graduated or, or anything like that, and invited them for a confidential conversation and said, you know, hey, I would love to take you to coffee and talk to you a little bit more about your experience as an RA. I want to know, what did you like? What did you not like? And I, I told them that I would keep their names anonymous and I would compile all of the feedback that I received and we would address it as a department. And what I found was really one unifying theme. Nearly all of these RAs left in part because they were dissatisfied with their hall director, their supervisor. And so as we dug in a little bit uh, more in depth, started to get some commonalities about why that dissatisfaction was, uh, was occurring. So heard a lot of lack of consistency between supervisors, which we know is a double-edged sword. Not every two, uh, not no two supervisors are the same. But we would hear stories of, you know, if you mess up uh, with policy A in this building, you get away with it. But if you mess up with the same policy in building B, you're fired, and that doesn't really feel very fair. Uh, heard a lot about lack of consistency between um, RAs on the same staff that. You know, if you were kind of in the in group with your supervisor, you were treated one way, held to one set of expectations. 
And if you were kind of outside of that group, it was a different story. Heard a lot about expectations not being adequately communicated. Some RAs, uh, former RAs at that time told me that you know, they had the written expectations, but it felt like they were being held accountable for things that were never communicated to them. And just for a larger context, within this department that I had joined, we had a pretty standard HR job action process with a verbal warning, a written warning, probation, then termination. Uh, but there were no written guidelines about what this should look like, what concerns would rise to what level. Uh, and so on one hand, that was good because it gave each supervisor autonomy. But on the other hand, that's, I think, where a lot of the inconsistencies came from. So once I had all of those meetings and, and thoroughly had my eyes open, uh, we realized we, we have some work to do. Um, and thankfully, everyone in the department was very on board with having some of these difficult conversations because we didn't want to have another year where we lost almost half of our RA team at semester. Uh, that is a huge impact on selection, on training, on communities. We did not want to have that happen again. So we created a working group, uh, mainly with our live-in full-time hall directors, and we started uh, to see that our live-in pros were telling us that supervising RA teams and the challenges that come with that were ranked as the most stressful part of their job. We would hear, yes, of course, the 2 a.m. suicide call is really, really challenging, but so is managing a staff that doesn't like me when I hold them accountable, right? So does uh, walking into a staff meeting where some uh, a staff member has just been let go for you know maybe drinking in the residence hall and everyone's mad at me and I can't say anything because of confidentiality. A lot of them felt unprepared, felt like their graduate programs didn't address supervision very adequately, and that the training that we were providing as an institution was not enough for them to do their jobs effectively in this way. So we kept asking these difficult fundamental questions. What is supervision? How do we as a department want to define it? How does it work? How do we learn to do it? What are we asking of our staff? And this was an RA focused project, but I think that these are helpful questions at any level in your organization. And how do we communicate uh, what we're asking our staff to do? How do we communicate expectations? How are we preparing new supervisors to be effective? And is that preparation enough? Are we assuming that folks who have a master's degree have a certain level of training or expertise in this area? And is that actually accurate with the curriculum that those folks went through? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. The outcome of all of this was we decided we wanted to create a written supervision model, supervision philosophy that we would communicate very openly and transparently with both the live-in professional staff and our student staff. So everyone was on the same page about what is supervision, how does it work here in this department, and whose responsibility is it to do what? So with this story, this brings us to problem number two. And, and this is more of an opinion thing, although having just written a dissertation about this, I think this is also supported in the literature within higher ed and student affairs, that meaningful training and preparation on how to be an effective supervisor is often missing from student affairs education, training, and professional development. Not to say that it's completely absent for everyone, but for many folks, it does not rec uh, receive the adequate time and attention that it deserves. Again, going back to my dissertation study participants, Matthew, who's another mid-level housing pro, talked about how the only time he really felt like he had training on how to supervise was at conferences, uh, and then also said that typically folks in, in student affairs, and this really resonates with me, uh, you build your supervision style based on what you've experienced in the past. So if you had a supervisor you liked, you copy what they did. If you had a supervisor that didn't work out so well, you do your best to not replicate the same behaviors. Uh, so a lot of folks kind of doing this trial by error supervision approach instead of guiding their uh, themselves by a meaningful philosophy. James was an entry level housing pro who, of course, uh, supervises a team of RAs and I think, you know, had a, a really beautiful metaphor in his visual representation. Uh, he is the cloud or he actually described himself as a sponge in the middle and then the clouds raining on him from above. Uh, are the previous supervisors he had, and he described it as his past supervisors and current supervisor 
kind of rain down their supervision style. He soaks that in like a sponge and then hopefully can filter out the bad and then rain down the good parts on his team. And then he he represented them by hopefully if, if it's just the good stuff that's raining down uh, their performance and, and success will grow like a flower, uh, which I, I think was just a, a neat visual representation of, of that philosophy. So next I'd like to tell you about uh, the model that we created at my previous institution uh, when we needed to find a supervision model. And so uh, anyone who knows me personally knows that I'm a big goofball. So uh, if you don't know Bill Nye or you would appreciate to not <laughs> see his uh, face in a webinar, I apologize, but uh, this is the Corey Peacock three pillars supervision model of science. Uh, pause for chuckles, right? Uh, so we wanted something that we could, that would be really easy to communicate with RAs that would be memorable. We didn't want to have this model that had, uh, you know, I think about like Chickering's vectors, uh, where maybe if you're a grad student, you can memorize that, but as a uh, as an RA, maybe that's less meaningful. So it's the three C's model, care, communicate, and coach, uh, each being a different pillar. So I'd like to dive into what that looks like. So as we created this, one of our goals was we want to articulate what does supervision look like, not only from the supervisor standpoint, but what does this look like from the supervisee experience and perspective as well? And we wanted to frame this as both the supervisor and the supervisee each have responsibilities that they have under each of these pillars to hold up their end of the bargain, so to speak, within a supervisory relationship. So first with the pillar of care, as a boss, it's your responsibility to care about your staff care about them as employees, care about them as whole people, people with lives outside of their role, people with multiple intersecting identities, people with mental health, care about them as people. And it's also your job to provide your staff with an environment that nurtures their success and enables them to be successful. On the supervisee side, something that we can't teach our staff is to care about their position and care about doing a good job. We want our staff to buy into our department or institutional missions and understand how the work that they do influences those missions. Uh, so that's their uh, version of meeting us halfway when it comes to care. And we'll dive in even further with each of these in the next couple of slides. With Communicate, it's the supervisor's job to communicate expectations clearly, be approachable, be, be available, and have ongoing conversations about performance. So not leaving folks like my friend Johnny feeling like there's this big absence of feedback. I don't know if I'm doing really well. I don't know if I'm not doing really well because my supervisor doesn't tell me, perhaps even when I ask. On the supervisee side of communicate, we need our supervisees to be open to these conversations, even when they might be difficult. We need our supervisors to feel comfortable communicating feedback they have for us as a supervisor and to be honest about their needs, right? Uh, especially if you've been in the field for a while, you can anticipate what your staff generally might need at different times of the year and at different points in their career, uh, but everyone is different and we, we can't read minds. We don't know exactly what you need unless you communicate with, that with us. And then finally with coach, it's the responsibility of a supervisor to identify and communicate performance concerns in a timely manner, early intervention is key, right? Work with staff to address these issues and then also help your staff with their professional development and continued growth. On the supervisee side, it's important that the supervisee be open to accepting this constructive feedback, actively work to remedy the issues that we talk to our folks about and take ownership of their professional development. I think of this particularly with our uh, entry level full-time folks that uh, your, your career trajectory and your professional development journey uh, is, is your own. Uh, you know, I can, uh, I actually was just having a conversation with one of my supervisees um, earlier today about how I, I can help connect you with all sorts of different opportunities to help set you up for whatever comes next, but only you can decide what that next step is going to be for you right? Because it's your career, ultimately, and, and your goals and your dreams. 
Diving in a little bit further, wanted to talk just a little bit more about the care pillar, which is all about, again, relationship, teams, and trust. So my first recommended exercise uh, that if we were in person, we might do as a breakout. Uh, I encourage you to discuss with your colleagues and in your teams specific strategies you can use to show your staff that you care about them and are invested in their success. Uh, and I also encourage you, if you have direct reports, to have very candid conversations with them. Do you feel that the work you do matters and is valued by the institution, by you as a, a, an individual supervisor? If no, why or why not? Uh, and what personal or institutional barriers, if any, are standing in the way of you being successful in your role? A uh, little mini story with this, uh, and this is one I think will probably resonate with a lot of you. Uh, if you worked in housing and residence life during the height of the pandemic, um, I have a friend here in, in Casper, Wyoming, who's a uh, elementary school teacher. And my goodness, it was rough for us in housing in during the height of COVID. I cannot imagine what it must have been like trying to get a kindergartner to keep their mask on in an elementary school, right? So tons of extra uh, work and stress and concerns about what if I get sick and take that home to my family. And the teachers in my friend's school were just completely and utterly burnt out. And they felt like the principal was not doing a very good job of recognizing how much the entire building was struggling and how burnt out and worn out and tired everyone on the team was. And then around Thanksgiving, the principal decided, you know, I think it's time for some recognition. And so she had uh, the school secretary cut out butcher paper turkey hands. It was right before Thanksgiving. And then she wrote a little note, we appreciate you, you know, I'm thankful for you, and taped a fun size snicker to each of these and put it in all of the staff's mailboxes. And I read actually lots of stories during COVID that were just like this. And I have to say, I've handwritten notes to my staff with little pieces of candy as well. But this, this activity did not go over well with these teachers because they felt like for months they were worked uh, down to the bone and were not receiving adequate uh, recognition or validation that the work that they were doing was seen and valued and mattered. And it kind of became a joke around the building of, you know, I put in all this time and got all these gray hairs and put myself in danger every day. And all I have to show for it is this fun size Snicker bar, right? Uh, so, you know, thinking about uh, building a culture of appreciation instead of a one-off activity that maybe feels a little uh, too little too late. A key takeaway here with care is, and uh, forgive the, the cheesy metaphor here, is your relationship with your staff is the foundation upon which your staff will be built. It is the soil from which good performance will grow, right? Uh, it is amazing how successful folks can be if they know that they're cared for and valued by um, your you and by the organization. So diving a little bit more into communicate, wanted to talk just a little bit about expectations. So uh, this is, I think, very common with folks who supervise RAs, but even for those of you on the call who maybe supervise full-time folks, if you don't have written expectations of your staff that are specific to you, Personally, as a supervisor, I really encourage you to create those and then workshop them with a trusted colleague or a mentor. You know, ask them, are they clear? Do they make sense? Are they concise? Are they reasonable? And most importantly, do they represent who you are as a supervisor? I have a document that I give every staff member when they join my team. It's called Working with Corey 101. And it's a, a combination of all the things I know about myself that are unique and all the things that I've heard about myself from others over the course of my career uh, that will help demystify kind of who I am and uh, what maybe matters to me more than uh, might matter to a different supervisor within the same team. We'll talk in a couple slides about Winston and Creamer synergistic supervision model, which is probably the biggest student affairs specific supervision theory out there. Uh, but in Winston and Creamer's study, and, and it was a while ago, about 25 years, 26 years ago, uh, but they found that when they surveyed supervisors, 
and asked, how much one-on-one -on -one time are you spending with your staff? And then they supervise, or they, excuse me, they surveyed supervisees. How much time does your supervisor spend with you? There was a huge mismatch. Supervisors felt that they were spending a lot more time one-on-one -on -one than the supervisees felt was accurate. Uh, and that leads into another point that I'd like to make of just how important one-on-one -on -one time is with each and every person that you supervise. And I know it's hard. We're all really busy. Many of us are understaffed. We have crises that come up every single day, but it's important. And I, I try to remind myself this at least once a week that we really make the most of our one-on-one -on -one time with our supervisees. This is where relationships are built. This is where feedback is shared and recognition. This is where our staff make meaning of their experience. And this is where growth and development are nurtured. And what I like to remind myself, and hopefully it might be helpful for some of you as well, is I want you to imagine something comes up in the area uh, that you supervise that's really urgent, that's a crisis, but you don't have a one-on-one -on -one with that staff member for another week and a half. Do you wait a week and a half? Absolutely not, right? Uh, we will always find and make time for crises. So keeping that in mind, it's really easy to have a one-on-one -on -one be completely taken up by whatever student issue is most pressing today, but really trying our best to maximize and hold that time uh, as sacred as possible because it is so important to how our staff feel uh, valued and, and their own development. Lastly, moving into the coach pillar, uh, this is all about feedback and action and action planning. Uh, my hot take, and I think I heard this in grad school, so I can't claim, I think it, I heard it about an assessment and then I just swapped it out for feedback, but feedback should be like flossing. It may never be fun, but if you do it regularly, at least it won't hurt too badly. So if you're like me and you see on your calendar, oh no, I have a dentist appointment in a week, and you think that you're going to trick your hygienist, which never works, uh, that week of flossing is always really, really painful. Feedback is the same, right? If you wait until a performance eval once a year to deliver all of this feedback, if you wait, like in my Johnny example, until the end of the year and then someone's mad at you that they didn't get a higher tier performance bonus, we're going to have some issues, right? So if we build a culture of feedback, it's still never going to be the highlight of our one-on-one -on -one time or our day, but at least it'll get easier. We'll build that muscle. A recommended exercise here, uh, and this is just a self-reflection, are you adequately recognizing good performance, right? When we think about coaching, we often think about underperforming employees and how to help people be better. That certainly is important. That's a part of coaching. But how are we making sure that people know that we appreciate them and that we're rewarding the good stuff as well? Um, especially if you supervise a large team, I think it's really easy to spend most of your supervision time with your lower performers and then kind of neglect your higher performers because they're doing things in the way that you want them to, but they need to hear that from you as well. Going back to my example, when we created this supervision model at a previous institution, we decided to complete, and we had the authority to do this because at this institution, our RAs were not considered university employees, uh, which was very nice, but we completely scrapped the whole verbal written warning probation process and replaced it instead with action plan letters. Some of them would be informal, some of them would be formal and would go in your HR file. But instead of staff viewing job action as something that happens to them in a transactional or punitive way, we tried to reframe that through a coaching and learning lens as an opportunity to collaborate with the staff member who's struggling about what's going on, how can we help you improve, how do we set up some goals with some actionable milestones and get you to the place that you need to be. The goal with action planning, and uh, even though now I work at a, an institution that with the full-time staff I supervise, uh, we do have an institutional progressive discipline process that is very similar with the warnings and then probation. Uh, if I, uh, and I haven't thankfully in, in a few years, uh, but when I have had to go through that process, I still put a written action plan in place. 
my goal there is to address the root source of the problem. So you're struggling with X, Y, Z in your job. Let's talk about why that is. So maybe it's punctuality with desk shifts for an RA. Maybe it's uh, decision-making while on duty and following protocols. Why is it that you're not following protocols? Is it a you get really stressed out and you blank when these situations happen? Uh, is it that you don't agree with our approach to incident response? What is it? Because it, until we know why this issue is happening, what the root cause is, we're not going to be very effective in actually meaningfully addressing what's going on. And so we put that into an action plan with tangible steps of we've identified this is the problem, this is why this problem is happening, and these are the things that we agree will be helpful to get us to a better place. And then it's not a one and done thing. It's not that you get this you know, slip of paper that says you've been written up, grr, be better, right? Uh, we talk about it until we feel confident that we are in uh, a better place. And then we can celebrate, right? That we had an issue, we worked on it, it got better, Ever, no one's perfect, and this is a real success story, right? So, so that's action planning. Going to move on to, to the two theories that come from student affairs literature. The first, as I mentioned or alluded to previously, is synergistic supervision, a model from Winston and Creamer that is getting up there in age, but you still see it cited quite a bit in the literature. Uh, they identified seven key components of synergistic supervision. Dual focus is kind of the big one that really gets the namesake of synergistic supervision, that as a supervisor, you should focus not only on cultivating good performance with your staff, but also focus on your staff's personal and professional development, uh, which, of course, makes a lot of sense, that dual focus. That supervision be a joint effort, uh, which I think you know is represented in that 3C model with the table that I shared a few slides back. That supervision is not a one-way street. There are things that uh, are the responsibility of the supervisor, and there are things that the supervisee needs to bring to that relationship as well. Two-way communication uh, is pretty self-explanatory. That we should be open and transparent. Our staff should feel like they can come to us. Uh, and have conversations that might be difficult. Then as a supervisor, you focus on building competence. Uh, of course, within housing and residence life, we have things like the Akuhu I core curriculum. We have the NASPA and ACPA professional competencies. You might have specific competencies or learning outcomes at your own institutions, particularly for student staff. Uh, so focusing on those things, making, making sure folks are learning and growing and developing in their roles. Speaking of growth, having a growth orientation, uh, also setting goals with your staff for their own development, uh, and having systematic and ongoing processing, which uh, I believe really falls into that one-on-one -on -one philosophy of sitting down and giving your staff members the time that they need to process how they're doing in their roles and how they're progressing as professional. So this is super synergistic supervision in a nutshell. My next slide kind of tells you and this is, I will admit, uh, a little self-serving of me saying, look at this thing that I created before I was a doc student and how well it lines up with the literature. Uh, had I been a doc student when I created the three C's model, you know, I could have gone through grounded theory method and then maybe we would see the three C's in a journal article somewhere. Uh, we did not go through IRB. So this is just Corey's, you know, model, Corey's thoughts. But I do feel like these principles line up pretty well with synergistic supervision. Uh, under care, we have dual focus and joint effort. Two-way communication and systematic ongoing processing feels very communication-oriented to me. And then focusing on our staff's competence, their growth, and setting and reaching goals feels very much like uh, the coach pillar. And that's something that whenever I read a leadership philosophy or, or theory or book uh, or supervision models, none of this seems like rocket science, right? Uh, all of this, you know, talks about relationships, it talks about feedback and coaching and communication. And we know that these are the keys to pretty much any human relationship on the planet. But we also know that we're humans and we're flawed and communication is hard and giving feedback is hard and showing care to a staff of 20 when you're really overwhelmed by your workload can be hard, right? 
So just because these are easy to understand doesn't mean that they're easy to implement. The next academic theory that I'd like to tell you just a little bit about uh, is one that I find really exciting. Winston Creamer is getting up there in age, not to say that it's bad by any means, but inclusive supervision is from the, the past five years. And so this team of researchers decided they wanted to build upon the foundation of synergistic supervision and decided, or, and I think very astutely pointed out that what was missing in synergistic supervision was a focus on multicultural competence and how identity plays into supervision. And of course, this is, uh, as we all know, extremely important. So what they developed, and you can Google it, Google Scholar, search it, uh, they developed an inventory to uh, help determine how in, of an inclusive supervisor you are. It's called the Inclusive Supervision Inventory for Student Affairs. You can use this to assess yourself or you know, if you're feeling really brave, you can give it to your supervisees to assess you as a supervisor. If you go out and look at this inventory, it has 24 individual factors that are lumped or categorized into four different components that really comprise the, the crux of the inclusive supervision theory. So the first is creating safe spaces. And the authors talk about this being open to feedback, uh, especially when that feedback might be identity-based recognizing the identities that your supervisees hold and helping supervisees navigate institutional culture given their multiple intersecting identities. Cultivating the whole self is about demonstrating a willingness to learn about identities that might be different than your own and experiences that are different than your own and to understand how intersectionality plays into the experience of your staff. Supervisor vulnerability is the third component, and this is about owning your mistakes or the limits of your own knowledge or experience when it comes to identity. So I identify as a cis white man, and uh, my supervisees who do not share those identities, I, I could be the most seasoned professional in the planet, I could read every article about multicultural competence, and I will never come close to understanding what it's like to move through my institution, my department, or the world with identities that are different than my own. And it's important as a supervisor that I have that vulnerability and be open uh, to learning and to be corrected when I'm wrong, which uh, my supervisees who are on the call can tell you is probably pretty often. The last component is capacity building in others, which is encouraging your supervisees to be more inclusive themselves, uh, providing opportunities for them to develop their own multicultural competence, and just making sure that we're not losing sight of how important identities and intersectionality are to the experiences of our students, our staff, and just people in general, and how that shapes power, privilege, systems, politics, and the reality of everyone's everyday uh, life. So we've made it through uh, all of the, the theory part of this presentation. Now I'd like to kind of move on to, uh, and this, you know, perhaps was a more relevant uh, title back last November, The Great Resignation. If, for those of you who don't uh, know or don't remember, uh, we saw a lot of articles across all industries uh, during about 2021-22 about um, the great resignation where a lot of people were leaving their jobs, switching to new employers. Uh, I, I think we definitely saw and continue to see that within higher ed and housing. Uh, I still see a lot of open uh, entry level live-in positions out there. I think a lot of folks left higher ed and student affairs and housing. Uh, so this was definitely front and center and one of the main themes that folks were really dying to talk about at last AIMHO last uh, November. And so I included a slide uh, about some of these stats and how this might relate to supervision. So back in 2021, Gallup did a poll um, at the height of the Great Resignation and found that 75% of employees who left an organization said that negative experiences with their boss was a contributing factor to why they left. And that is a staggering statistic, but it's, to be honest, not a statistic that surprises me in the slightest, right? Think back to Johnny's story where you know, negative experience with boss, 
build this sense of unhappiness. And all of a sudden, all of these opportunities with remote work and, and shuffling are available to you. It, it shouldn't be a surprise that a lot of folks decided to move on to uh, greener pastures. There was this article uh, by Minson 2021 with this quote that I love, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses, right? Uh, so really backing up that Gallup uh, percentage there. Gandhi and Robeson also in 21 uh, found, I think they were, uh, they did a study for Gallup, found that uh, if an employee has a good engaging manager, on average, it takes a 20% salary increase to convince them to leave. But if they're not happy, next to nothing, right? Uh, so, you know, when we when we see inflation rising, when we uh, see uh, salaries staying where they are, and I know a lot of that is outside of folks' control, especially if you're in a budget reduction environment or have declining enrollment, uh, knowing that I'm, this is not me making an argument for not giving your people a raise. <laughs> Let's be clear uh, for that. Definitely do that if you can. Uh, but it's not just about the money when people leave. Uh, my take on all of this is, you know, while a lot of this was coming to the forefront during the Great Resignation, you know, in the aftermath of COVID, I really don't think that this is new. Uh, and I don't think it's specific to higher education, right? I think a lot of folks, uh, probably I would endeavor most of you on this call have probably chosen to leave an institution or a department at some point in your career because you were unhappy with your workplace culture. So this leads me to my soapboxy call to action, which is, and you all know this, housing and residence life work is challenging enough on its own. There's no need to add poor supervision on top of things. Our field must do a better job of preparing, preparing supervisors, prioritizing effective supervision, and communicating the incredible impact supervision has on our staff's satisfaction, well-being, and success. So you might be thinking, and I wouldn't blame you, okay, Corey, that was a bit grim, maybe a little catastrophizy. So let me try to save a little bit of face here. I know there are definitely excellent supervisors out there. And I know that there are departments and uh, grad school programs that are doing a great job of providing supervision, training, and education, but there are not enough. There are so many stories out there of poor supervision experiences. It's alarmingly common. I have to say, I don't know if any of you look at the Residence Life Professionals Facebook page, but I see stories about this every single day. And in my dissertation, every single participant, including the seasoned leaders, told me about at least one supervisor in their career who they felt caused them emotional distress. Folks, that's too many. Uh, I hope, you know, my, my soapboxy hope is that if someone were to do a supervision dissertation study within Housing and Residence Life in 10 years, that none of the participants would say that their supervisor caused them emotional distress. Uh, but at least in, in my study, it was every single one of them, which I think is really unfortunate. We also know that the Great Resignation, I think, brought renewed urgency to these issues as we grapple as a field with an evolving workforce. I think it's becoming more and more challenging to convince folks to take RA positions. It's more and more challenging to convince folks that living where you work as a live-in professional staff and taking those 2 a.m. suicidal student phone calls is something that is, is worth $35,000 a year in an apartment that hasn't been updated in 30 years, right? I'm, I'm generalizing here a little bit, uh, but there is some good news. And one of the things that encourages me a lot is that not only do we have effective strategies that exist, we have good theories out there, uh, we have a lot of places that are doing really good work, but Akuhawai, which is an organization I think very highly of, has identified enabling work, workforce sustainability as a priority. With the, If you're not familiar, I, I do encourage that you look up the Future of the Profession initiative. Uh, you know, I, I think Akuhai really realizes that we're at a pivotal crossroads in housing and residence life work, student affairs work, and in higher education as an industry. And the way that we've done things for the past 50 years are not going to be the way that we need to do them for the next 50 years. We need a paradigm shift 
We need to be flexible. We need to be open to change and realize uh, that we do have some problems in this area, particularly, I think, in supervision uh, as a field that we need to grapple with. So uh, I apologize for ending on a bit of a grim catastrophizing note, but you know, again, there are, are really great resources out there. Uh, if you all feel that uh, you have a supervisor who is awesome or your department does a really great job of developing uh, supervisory skills, I really encourage you to take those opportunities to share your knowledge at conferences, you know, host a webinar like this. We need to spread uh, the supervision love around this field. So uh, one day, the numbers of folks who have these really terrible experiences starts to go down. So I thank everyone for attending today. I thank you for your attention. As another plug, uh, if you would like me to send any of my materials to you, whether it be the slide deck or the supervision manual that I created, uh, go ahead and drop me an email. It looks like we have about nine minutes left. So if anyone has uh, any questions, I would love to uh, entertain those. Thanks so much. Stop my share. And feel free to drop questions in the chat too if you don't want to unmute. While folks are thinking about questions, I'll also just share. Um, you know, Corey brought up the future of the profession task force. If you're attending the content conference series in October, um, there is a whole track of programming related to the future of the profession. So lots of information will be shared there. Um, and certainly more things will be coming out as we get a little further uh, with that that work group. But thank you, John. I sent my email in the chat. So if you'd like to just copy and paste it. Thank you so much for your presentation today, Corey. Um, I do have a quick question. You had shared a statistic regarding supervisees experiencing emotional distress. And I had written down kind of in my notes here, how much of that emotional distress can be tied to quote unquote growing pains, right? So when we challenge our supervisees perspective or ways of thinking with appropriate levels of support and we're having difficult developmental conversations, how do we balance kind of that emotional stress and levels of support with these are opportunities for you to improve and grow as an individual? Absolutely. Thanks so much for the question, Blair. And uh, this reminds me, you know, that the statistic of, that I cited was every uh, participant in my personal dissertation study. It was a qualitative study uh, with 12 participants. Uh, just within those 12 folks' experience, the emotional distress that they talked about was was really egregious behavior. You know, one talked about having a supervisor who would go into her office and knock things off of her desk. Uh, you know, would have these you know little kind of anger tantrums. Uh, you know, not a lot of them were talking about just not being happy with um, having a really difficult conversation. But I, I do think that that exists out there in the field as well. Uh, it came up in my defense, you know, one of the faculty on my committee asked about generational differences, which I definitely think are uh, are at play here. You know, I, uh, I, I don't want to pick on any generation in, uh, in particular, but as we move into Gen Z in the workforce, things are different. We see that every time we welcome a new generation. And so uh, everything is connected. We can't always assume that uh, folks who are starting professional work will have the same life experiences and skills that uh, folks had 20 years ago. And that's not necessarily good or bad. It's just different. Uh, and so, you know, I think the easy answer to that is uh, everything is connected. Maybe it's it's a hard answer <laughs> is everything is connected. And we just have to take into uh, account the big picture of what our folks are bringing to the table. And if they are coming to us, maybe with uh, some opportunities for growth and in terms of being able to receive challenging feedback. I think we need to put our heads together about how do we get them to a better place, right? Um, because we can't control all of the learning opportunities that had been missed in their life until they came to us. 
right? And we see this in higher ed all the time, right? We uh, it's easy to point our finger at high schools and say, you know, well, why, you know, why can't you teach your students about uh, healthy coping mechanisms or how to have challenging conversations with your roommate? But guess what? When they're on our campus, they're our problem now, right? Hi, I do have a question, if that's okay. okay. I know we're like five minutes into two, but uh, I just want to thank you very much for like, you know, posting this and, you know, it's very informative so far as a recent, you know, new professional. So I really appreciate it. So my question is, I'm just kind of curious about your study about, you know, um, the difference between like, you know, thinking about intersectionality, thinking about like different supervision style. Um, is there like kind of like experiences of like BOC or some kind of like data in regards to that of their experiences? Like, you know, BOC supervisee and you know, supervisor kind of thing and vice versa. Um, yes, because this are valid, but I was just kind of curious for like, you know, if there's any data or anything about difference between experience between different identities. So I'm just yes. curious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I went pretty fast through the inclusive supervision uh, slide, which I think is a great theory, at least in my dissertation study, uh, identity came uh, across as a theme quite a bit, especially among the new staff who held uh, minoritized identities. You know, and uh, one of the, the themes from, from my dissertation was that uh, folks tended to talk about their supervisor as if they were kind of the face of their overall experience at um, the institution that they worked for, right? So if they were feeling like it wasn't a very racially uh, inclusive place, their supervisor was kind of the face of that problem. Um, and so the reverse of that was true as well, right? If they felt cared for, um, even in maybe a more challenging environment based on politics or demographics or what have you, uh, that found that that relationship with the supervisor uh, was really critical in shaping how folks talked about their overall experience um, having one of those identities on uh, on campus. And again, you know, that that was with 12 folks. And so a lot of uh, experiences out there might be different, but that uh, was definitely something that came across. Thank you. Well, thank you all again for attending. I'll turn it back over to Meredith if you have any closing thoughts from the Kubo. Thank you. I just want to say um, thanks to folks for attending this afternoon. Thanks for your good questions. And of course, thank you to Corey for sharing your presentation today. I'll stay on for just a minute if there's like one final question that someone wants to ask, but thanks all. <laughs>